Welcome. My name is Michaela Garkish and I'm a nurse in the Cardiac Rehab Program. I have the pleasure today in speaking to you about your cardiovascular risk factors. I would like for you to take a minute to read this disclaimer slide. All the information that is presented in today's session it is, is not a substitute, nor does it replace professional medical advice that you will receive. If you are in Canada and you're having a medical or health emergency, call your healthcare professional or 911 immediately. Now, today's learning objective will be, we are going to define cardiovascular disease. We are reviewing the risk factors for the development of cardiovascular disease. We will discuss target goals to prevent the progression of cardiovascular disease. And hopefully, you will understand how you can reach these targets goals and prevent future heart problems. And at the end, I have a review of resources that can help and support you in achieving those healthy goals. Now, what is cardiovascular disease? Cardiovascular disease is defined as the disease that can affect your arteries of your heart. And not just the arteries of your heart, but all blood vessels in your body. As you can see on this beautiful slide, you have a heart and it's the arteries that sit on top of your heart muscle. So not the blood flow that goes through the heart, but the blood vessels that sit on top of your heart are coronary arteries. And initially they are pristine. You see the platelets flowing through them quite easy. And what happens over time is for some people is that you're starting to develop plaque. So the plaque settles in the walls of the vessel and as time progresses, the plaque becomes more dense and it is more difficult for these platelets to flow through. And sometimes they bunch up together and block the blood flow completely, which then is a heart attack. The most common causes of cardiovascular disease are these fatty deposits in the inner walls of the vessels. And what happens is the vessel becomes more narrow and the arteries become blocked. And abnormal blood glucose levels, for example, can irritate the walls of the vessels. And you will hear me say that repeatedly when we talk about risk factors for cardiovascular disease, that whatever risk factors there are, they're irritating the walls of the vessels. And the irritation enhances the buildup of fatty deposits. And these blockages don't just happen in those coronary arteries, like you saw in the previous slides, but they can also lead uh, they can also block the walls of the vessels in the neck, blood vessels, or blockages in the legs, which then can cause pain when walking. Now, there's two kinds of risk factors. There are the risk factors that we cannot change. We call those the non-modifiable risk factors. And those are your age, your sex, your ethnicity, and your family history. And I have many patients who say heart disease is in my genes and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, you're wrong. There are many, many risk factors that you can actually change. and You can still be the captain of your ship. And these are the ones that we're going to discuss in greater detail today. Smoking, for example, elevated blood glucose levels, higher blood pressure, being overweight or obese, the nutrition, physical inactivity, high cholesterol levels, and stress and depression. These are risk factors that you can actually change. First one, smoking. Smoking is one of the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And it is not so much the nicotine in the cigarettes, but it is these chemicals that are getting released in your bloodstream and that make your blood vessels sticky. So it is like glue that is attracting that plaque so very easily. And then what happens is the, the fatty substances in your blood get deposited more easily. It narrows the blood vessels. And with that, you're reducing the blood flow, which then can lead to cardiovascular disease. Now, how does smoking affect your heart? For smoking raises your LDL or lousy cholesterol. It can speed, it's a stimulant, so it speeds up your heart rate. It makes your heart work a lot harder, and it can actually lower that HDL, that healthy cholesterol that we are so after. 
And with that also, you can raise your blood pressure. It has to do with the heart working harder and therefore the blood pressure gets increased. And smokers can actually have a two to four times more likely chance of suffering a heart attack than non-smokers. So what can you do? If you're interested, and we encourage you greatly to be interested in quitting smoking, we have an extremely successful smoking cessation program at the Heart Institute, and you can self-refer. All you have to do is phone this, you can phone this number or send an email to the smoking cessation group, and they will get in touch with you and help you quitting smoking. It's a free program. Another risk factor, alcohol. The overall message is that we recommend that you do not drink alcohol. But should you wish to drink, the recommendations are no more than two drinks a day for a man and one drink a day for a woman. And you can save it either as well and just have seven or eight drinks on the weekend. And if you do have a disease, which is alcoholic cardiomyopathy, where alcohol has actually damaged your heart muscle, then there's, or you're pregnant, then certainly no alcohol is recommended. And when it comes to the sizes of drinks, these are not these big goblins that you fill to the top, but it's an ounce of liquor, five ounces of wine, or 12 ounces of light beer. Blood pressure is another risk factor. And blood pressure is comprised of two numbers. We have the top number, which is the systolic, and that is the force that the heart has to pump against with each heartbeat. And the bottom number is what we call the diastolic blood pressure, which is the force or the pressure that when the heart fills with blood. The recommendation for blood pressure, they have changed recently. So it is now less than 140 over 90 in the doctor's office, and less than 135 over 85 at home, because at home you're more relaxed, it's a more calming environment, so that's why you're allowed to have lower blood pressure, expected to have a lower blood pressure at home. And if you are diabetic, which already is a risk factor, and we'll talk about diabetes a little bit later, then the blood pressure is supposed to be under 130 for the top number and under 80 for the bottom number in the doctor's office and at home. And my patients always ask me, is one number more important than the other? The top number and the bottom numbers, they really are of equal importance. And the intent is that with blood pressure medicine that you are taking, that both numbers get reduced. And it is also very, very normal that with exercise, your numbers, ideally the top number goes up and the bottom number comes down. But then in the long-term effects, the long-term positive effects of exercise is that both numbers get lowered. And the question also comes up very often is, do I need to take my blood pressure? So in this new world of, of having Zoom visits and phone calls now with your healthcare professional, we rely very heavily on, on the numbers that you provide. So it probably is a good investment in having a blood pressure machine and checking your blood pressure. And the best time to check your blood pressure depends on what you're after. If you're evaluating the effectiveness of your blood pressure medication, then the best time is about two hours after you've taken those medications. If you're not on blood pressure medication and you just want to know what your blood pressure is, then probably early in the morning is the best. So what happens if you over the long term have higher blood pressure? You now know the targets that we are after and not a one time high blood pressure can cause that. This is really a long term effect of that. So higher blood pressure damages the walls of the vessels. And by damaging the walls of the vessels, that fat gets deposited more easily. Over time, then it narrows the blood vessel and reduces the blood flow. And then that can lead to cardiovascular disease. Physical inactivity is another huge cardiovascular risk factor. Increasing your physical activity is a key strategy, not only for reducing your risk for cardiovascular disease, but also for improving your overall health. The World Health Organization has put out new physical activity guidelines indicating that adults should be aiming to reducing sedentary activity as much as possible. And physical activity includes 
leisure time and active work-related activities in addition to purposeful exercise, which is comprised of aerobic exercise and strength training. And both of them are very, very important. And in terms of exercise, the aim is to accumulate about 200, 150 to 200 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise each week. And for one thing for certain, we know that some exercise is better than none. But your goal should really be in trying to achieve 20 to 60 minutes, three out of five times per week of that moderate to vigorous exercise. And our healthcare professionals in cardiac rehab, the physiotherapists and the nurses, they can certainly help you in establishing an exercise program that will be tailored to your needs and capabilities. Moving on, obesity. We understand that obesity is a very complex disease and that there are many, many factors which can affect your weight. And we used to use a measure called a BMI, which is a measure of your height and your weight. But we do understand that it is not an accurate tool in identifying obesity-related complications. And we are really trying to get away from the actual weight on the scale, but more, more realistic and more positive measures when it comes to obesity. The other thing is also, it's very important also where you carry your weight. So you might have heard of that apple versus the pear analogy. So it's the weight around your abdomen is the one that we, we encourage you to work on and get more physically active. And then hopefully you're reducing the inches in that area because this is considered, this is something that's called visceral fat. And that is definitely a health risk. And how does obesity, how does carrying your weight, extra weight around the abdomen can impact your health? If you're overweight, your heart has to pump a lot harder to get those nutrients to the cells because it is almost like a buffer that it has to pump through. And with that, the heart working harder, it increases your blood pressure. And being overweight, people tend to have higher blood pressure tend to have higher cholesterol and higher blood sugars. And all these are individual risk factors for heart disease. And you're just compounding more and more risk factors. What can you do? You should aim, again, not so much the number on the scale, but aim for your best weight. What is the weight that you feel good about yourself, that you can be active and maintain your healthiest lifestyle and still enjoy. And the goal should not be to lose weight. We really discourage people from setting that as a goal, but it is an outcome measures and an outcome measure. And if you are choosing more heart healthy foods, increasing your physical activity, then you're way on your way of achieving that goal. Mental health, another risk factor. And it is not so much the stresses that you have in your life, because we all have stresses in our life, especially now with COVID, uh, mental health has gone up tremendously, but it's the way you handle negative emotions. That is what is important. So stress, anxiety, and depression, they can actually have physical effects on your body. Your heart rate can become irregular. Your blood pressure gets increased. We've all been in this situation where we feel like we're going to explode. Of course, your blood pressure is going to increase with those kinds of sensations. The fat cells become converted into cholesterol and the platelets can become sticky and build up in your arteries. What can you do? Exercise. Some exercise is better than none. And more exercise is better than some. Just getting out there, get in the outdoors, try to be active. Enjoy the fresh air, the sunshine. We always say the goal is really crossing the starting line. Reducing alcohol consumption. Remember, no more than two drinks a day for a man and no more than one drink a day for a woman. And no binging on the weekend. Learn to relax. There's an incredible amount of free yoga, mindfulness training now on YouTube. 
And maybe this is a great chance to try these relaxation techniques in the comfort of your own home. Find a supportive network. There's lots of groups out there. People are meeting via Zoom, uh, your neighbors that you can maybe go for walks with. Start your own little group. And uh, people find a supportive network extremely important and support and uh, positive. Take medications if you're prescribed. Now we are talking about cholesterol levels. On your cardiac risk profile that you were sent through my chart at the beginning of our program, we took, I, we either send you for blood work or you have a recent blood work available. And the things that we're interested in is those lipid profiles. One of the fats in your body is called cholesterol. And as you can see on this slide, that gold looking substance, this is what cholesterol is. And cholesterol is important. We do need cholesterol in our bodies, but we all have too much. And if you do have too much, it starts to build up in the walls of the vessels. And that can then lead to cardiovascular disease. When you had a blood test called a lipid profile, we were looking at three different kinds of fats. I always say the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good cholesterol is that HDL. You want to have it as high as possible. And HDL regulates LDL, the lousy cholesterol stor storage, and it promotes excretion. LDL is the lousy cholesterol. This is the fat that stores cholesterol in your body. This is what the statins are targeting. So you take cholesterol medication, and this is what you're taking it for to reduce your LDL or lousy cholesterol. And then we also have triglycerides. And triglycerides is fuel carbohydrates that is a that has not been burned, and that then gets converted into triglycerides and stored as fat in the body. So how can that cholesterol buildup lead to a heart attack? So again, that beautiful heart with the coronary arteries on top, and you see a cross-section of one of your coronary arteries, one of the branches of it. And what happened is you started to develop plaque in the blood vessel, which made the lumen smaller. We talked about that earlier. And now your platelets have bunched up and they blocked the blood flow completely. And this is what is a heart attack. If there's just not enough blood flow, that's angina. But if the blood vessel gets blocked completely, this is what we call a heart attack. And it's also significant where on that tree you had the blockage. So the higher on, on the tree is more significant because a larger area of the heart muscle would have been damaged. If it is lower, it is still a heart attack, but there's very the significance of the damage is not that great. And the other thing is also important is how long is this blood flow occluded? And so we always say that time is muscle. So the quicker you come to the Heart Institute or you come to, to a center near you and have that blockage reopened and restore the blood flow, then this damage gets done to the heart muscle. So the targets for cholesterol. So you have your own results on your cardiac risk profile, and you can follow along with that. So the target for that LDL or lousy cholesterol is 1.8 for people who have cardiovascular disease. And we'll talk about a little bit more detail exactly at the numbers that are targeted at the end of the session when we go over your risk profile. So what can you do? You can reduce your LDL, and it is gets reduced. Remember, we, I was talking about that statin, the cholesterol medication that most of you are taking. They are very, very effective in reducing your LDL. Cook it. Cook at home. Then you're aware of what it is that you are taking. Often takeout food or restaurant food is really high in cholesterol, or you're often not even aware how much is in there. Reading labels is also really important. And cholesterol is in animal products. I always say animals that have four legs have high cholesterol. Plant-based foods. Plants do not have cholesterol. So if you are leaning towards a diet that is higher in plant food, then you are definitely lowering your cholesterol 
from a nutritional perspective. The triglycerides eat less sugar, including less pop or juice, very concentrated sugar and alcohol. Reduce your alcohol intake. Aim for your two drinks a day, less than nine drinks per week. Increase your HDL, your good cholesterol. Now, smoking actually lowers your HDL and being more active. Activity, physical activity can actually raise your HDL or good cholesterol. And we do have the top 10 tips for healthy living. I will get you some resources at the end of the presentation. And if you are prescribed cholesterol medications, do take them. Another huge risk factor for cardiovascular disease is prediabetes and diabetes. Abnormal glucose levels often before you know that you have prediabetes or diabetes affect your heart. Early on, before the diagnosis of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, in insulin resistance occurs in folks predisposed to diabetes, either due to genetic factors, meaning you have it in your family, environmental factors, and medications such as steroids. The role of insulin is to unlock your cell doors so that the glucose can be used to fuel your body. They're kind of the car that drives the fuel into your cells. Over time, your cells don't recognize the insulin key. And as a result, the pancreas starts to increase production of insulin in an effort to unlock the cell doors and move glucose into the cells. Eventually, this effort fails, resulting in glucose levels high enough that you feel unwell. Specifically, symptoms such as increased thirst, fatigue, hunger, and increased urination are very common symptoms. Increasingly, the larger, interestingly, the larger the vessels in your heart are actually impacted first by this elevated glucose levels. And what happens, it's irritating the walls of the vessels and enhancing again that buildup of that fatty deposits. And ideally, by maintaining a healthy body weight through regular exercise, healthy eating, and managing stress, this can greatly reduce your risk to develop that onset of prediabetes or diabetes. And often people that have higher glucose, blood glucose levels also have increased incidences of higher blood pressure, tend to be obese, and tend to have higher cholesterols. Prediabetes. What is prediabetes? So prediabetes is a condition where your blood glucose levels are abnormal, but not high enough yet to be diagnosed and treated for diabetes. So the lab test hemoglobin A1c is a non-fasting, meaning you don't have to be fasting, a lab test. That, you, that can be done to screen for prediabetes and diabetes. But it is also a means of determining your glucose control once diagnosed with diabetes. And it usually gets done every three to six months. If you have a healthy hemoglobin, this lab test is a very accurate way to look at how much glucose has stuck to your mature red blood cell. And a hemoglobin of 5.9 or less is the normal range as per the current Diabetes Canada recommendations. If your hemoglobin A1c is between 6.0 and 6.4%, you are considered pre-diabetic. And actually just a 5% weight loss and ongoing maintenance with healthy eating and physical activity has shown to delay the onset of diabetes for many years. Hemoglobin A1c of 6.5 or greater is considered diabetic. And once diagnosed, it is important to maintain a hemoglobin A1c of less than 7% to reduce your risk of ongoing complications. So the target for most patients is a hemoglobin A1c. If you have the diagnosis of diabetes, remember the target is under 7% which if you would poke your finger, it would be between four and seven before you eat something. And then two hours later, between five and 10. Now the normal range, so the non-diabetic person, a hemoglobin A1C of under 5.9% and 
which would mean if you were poking your finger, it would be a blood sugar between four and six when you're fasting. So before you're eating, and then two hours later, between five and eight. As mentioned earlier, healthy eating and physical activity helps to achieve and maintain a healthy weight. And this is important not only for heart health, but also for glucose management. There are community pre-diabetes and diabetes education programs that have certified diabetic nurses and dietitians that are eager to meet with you individually or in small groups. Currently, they're virtual, but they can work with you on the path of controlling your glucose. You can call or book online your appointment with these teams and no doctor referrals are required. Now, folks living with diabetes need to manage their cholesterol levels and their blood sugar a little bit better than those not living with diabetes. So as you heard me say oh, before, the, the guidelines for the blood pressure levels were under 140 and under 90 for people that don't have diabetes and the diabetic ones, the control has to be even tighter because of that extra risk factor in the impact of glucose on your blood level, on your blood. Diabetes has really evolved over time and uh, medications are changing constantly in the management of diabetes. And sometimes you might need to be started on insulin to get that blood glucose control in conjunction with healthy eating and physical activity. And a glucose meter is a terrific tool for you to see the impact of your lifestyle choices, choices and medication on your glucose level. So connect with a diabetes team in your community to learn more about the self-management of glucose. So to prevent abnormal glucose levels, we encourage to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lots of fiber in your diet and protein each meal that's spread evenly throughout your day to maintain that even blood glucose control. Move more and sit less and choose an activity that you enjoy. So you can aim for those 20 to 60 minutes, three out of five days for, per week of that moderate to vigorous intensity exercise. And if you smoke, try ways to quit smoking because again, you're adding another risk factor. So what can you do? One of the big things is that we encourage our patients is to cook, to prepare your own meals so you know what you're putting in your body. Reading labels. We have an amazing dietitian that has put out a lot of educational videos of exactly that to help you in, in being more mindful of your dietary choices. Move more and sit less. Choose an activity that you enjoy and that fits with your lifestyle. And again, trying to aim for those 20 to 60 minutes, three out of five times a day. And a little bit of exercise is better than none. It's whatever you are able to do. Every step that you take, your heart thanks you. Achieve and maintain a healthy weight. It's actually worse to lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight, and lose weight than just stabilize your weight at a level where you can be active and you can be happy with the weight that you are carrying. Increase your fruits and vegetables. The aim is for seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day combined and reduce your alcohol intake. Aim for less than two drinks a day. Manage your stress. Stay connected with those who care. And at the Heart Institute, we actually have a whole mental health team that offers management in terms of group session, like managing your emotions, stress management. And if you're interested in any of those sessions, you can reach out to your mentor in being signed up for those groups. Controlling your blood glucose. Take your medication as prescribed. Monitor your blood pressure. Keep a log of it. It's very important that you know what your blood pressure is. And remember, we, I was talking to you about when is the best time to take your blood pressure. And that's the blood pressure that we are interested in. And if you smoke, try to quit. So now I just wanted to go over this risk profile. Now you were all sent a risk profile it's usually after you had that initial intake session and it's tailored specifically to you. So you can see where are you at in terms of risk factors. What are the risk factors that you have to be working on? 
So the biggest risk factor, so it's these three columns. The first one is are the risk factors. The center are the target values. And the last one are your own personal values. So smoking is the biggest risk factor. You now know that the goal is to be smoke-free. Physical activity, 20 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise, three out of five times. And again, some exercise, for some people, it's unrealistic to exercise for 20 to 60 minutes. But maybe you can exercise for five minutes, maybe three times a day. So some exercise is better than no exercise, but more exercise is better than some. Where are you at in terms of exercise? And remember that we can help you in establishing an exercise program. And in terms of intensity, that moderate to vigorous, your moderate to vigorous might be very different from my moderate to vigorous. For some people just walking, it's a lot of effort for them. That's a vigorous exercise. So it's really very individual how you're feeling about the intensity of your exercise. Now blood pressure. The target, remember, is 140 over 90 in your doctor's office or less than 135 over 85 at home. And if you're diabetic, it should be under 130 over 80 for the target. And we're really very good in establishing what is high blood pressure. The low blood pressure, there's really no finite number what is too low. It's very much symptom driven. Obesity. Achieve your best weight. So that is the way that you can maintain and be active and lead a healthy lifestyle with that. So we're trying to get away from the scale, from that number on the scale. Another good measure, remember I was telling you about the analogy of the apple and the pear. So the waist measurement is actually a quite accurate measurement of see where you're at. And different ethnicities have different, obviously different frames. And that's why the numbers are different. So it's a great tool to, to measure, to see where you're at. So the women, um, as you can see, like I said, usually the women, on, and it's also where they're measured. So the men, we actually have a video of how to measure. Men are measured at the belly button, not where you're carrying your pants, unless you're carrying them at the belly button. And women, it's that spot between your belly button and your hip bone. Now, you were also asked to fill in a form, a screening tool, which we call PHQ-9 or 2 and GAD-7. And this is a tool to screen for anxiety and depression. And each answer has a, a numerical value. And a score of less than 10 um, is what we consider that you're managing your mental health well. And over that, you might need a little bit of help in dealing with that. And like I was saying, we have a mental health team at, in cardiac rehab that can help you managing your emotions, stress management. So again, let your mentor know if you're interested in participating in these kinds of activities. Then nutrition, we ask you how many servings of fruits and vegetables you're eating. And ideally, the target is more than seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And I think a little bit, it also applies like with exercise, more, a little bit more is better than none. And these are your uh, lipid profile results. So the cholesterol levels. So the LDL, which is that bad or lousy cholesterol, and the HDL is the good cholesterol. So too much of the LDL can damage the walls of the vessel and lead to higher risk for heart attack or stroke. And the higher the HDL, the more protected you are against that fatty buildup in your arteries known as plaque. And the total cholesterol HDL ratio compares how much good cholesterol is in your blood relative to the overall cholesterol level. So the target for the HDL is over one, the higher the better, the non-HDL under 2.6. And the LDL, if you do have that diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, PAD or diabetes, your target is below 1.8. And under two, if you do not have coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease or diabetes. Now triglycerides, we were talking about those as well. Ideally, they're supposed to be under 1.7 as a target. 
the new hemoglobin A1C, we talked about that as well, under six for those who are not diabetic and under seven who are diabetic. That means that your diabetes is well controlled. Now, we also do know that it is not only patients with cardiovascular disease that are participating in cardiac rehab and that are circling through the Heart Institute. So we also have patients with arrhythmia problems that have problems where the heart muscle has been affected. We have transplant patients. Now, all these patients are also, although not specifically have the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, but certainly have the same cardiovascular risk factors. If you are participating in our cardiac rehabilitation program, you have a person that's called a mentor. And your mentor is your go-to person during the program in terms of questions, if you want to have additional referrals. So it's really your contact person while you are in cardiac rehab. And it's usually the person that did that intake session with you. Last but not least, this is the resources slide that I was telling you about. You have access to a heart healthy living guide, to many heart healthy eating videos that Kathleen, our dietitian, has produced, coronary artery disease and recovering from heart attack videos. So the best resource is really the Ottawa Heart Institute website. So if you go to ottawaheart.ca, patients slash visitors, tools and resources, you have uh, an endless amount of, of valuable resources when it comes to cardiac health. I just wanted to thank you for your attention, for your interest. And hopefully, we'll see you out there exercising and uh, becoming more heart healthy. Thank you very much.